Welcome to the Center for U.S. War Veterans Oral Histories at the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seeger, a partner of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Today is January 28, 2019. I am Carol Fowler, Director of the Center. My honored veteran today is retired Captain Thomas J. Arminio, who served in the United States Navy from June of 1977 until June of 2001 and was in Operation Desert Calm, Operations Deny Flight, Operation Sharp Guard, as well as the Cold War. He was a pilot, among many other titles that he <laughs> held in his uh, lengthy military career. Um, thank you for wanting to be here today, Tom. I can call you Tom? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay, good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, your eyewitness account is considered a primary historical source and a valuable contribution to the Veteran Oral History Project. And good morning and welcome. Thank you. Tom, we should say how you know about this project. Actually, family connection. Uh, my sister and you know each other, my older sister Barbara, and then my dad, who was a World War II Navy veteran, he was a corpsman. Uh, he participated in this as well as Barbara's husband, Dennis, uh, my brother-in-law, he participated in it. So I know about your, your project, your initiative through family, word okay. of mouth. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned your dad as Navy, so would you say that uh, motivated you or influenced you to become Navy yourself? Um, not, not significantly, I would say. Uh, only a little bit. Um, yeah, he he talked about his career uh, during the war uh, a little bit as as I was growing up, or as all of us were growing up. And he wanted to stay in. He wanted to make the Navy a career. Uh, but at the end of World War II, the country was demobilizing, or the the Department of Defense was demobilizing, and. You know, they said, thank you for your, your service, but right. we don't, you know, we don't need you anymore. He wanted to go to OCS, get a commission, um, and he wanted to stay in, but it just didn't work out that way, you know, after the war. How did you end up at the United States Naval Academy? Um, yeah, some, a couple of different inputs there. Uh, primarily, it was wrestling. I wrestled uh, at Seton Hall Prep and I wanted a wrestling college and so I started looking around and I got recruited uh, by the Naval Academy and a couple other schools and um, so this That's as a high school senior you know it was a pretty pretty big decision and uh, so um, yeah decided to go to the Academy to wrestle yeah. and one, then once I got there of course then you know, obviously, I looked at my career options and. What kind of adjustment was it for you to go there? Oh, huge, huge adjustment. Mm -hmm. uh, but wrestling um, really helped me. I mean, just the the discipline uh, that it takes to wrestle uh, helped me uh, get through the academy. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, very very structured environment. Right. Um, academically, it was really tough for me. Um, but the wrestling, the wrestling definitely helped help me make the adjustment. The, the physical aspects of the Naval Academy and those kinds of things and plebe summer didn't really bother me that much. It was, it was mostly uh, the academic side that I had to really buckle down. International security affairs? The, that's my master's degree. Oh, oh, that's my undergraduate degree in right. international security affairs, right? Yeah, political science, international security, uh, foreign policy, those kinds of things topics yeah and of course it was a cold war then right and Vietnam was just winding down right. so uh, primary focus in my curriculum was the Soviet Union and China uh, those are the courses I really focused on yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you were class president I was yeah the the Naval Academy has a formal rank structure among the midshipmen, among um, the brigade, the brigade of midshipmen. Uh, the class president and class officers uh, that got elected um, really 
uh, was focused on looking ahead after graduation. So the class president's job is really to coordinate the alumni and alumni giving and making, try to get members of the graduating class to join the alumni association. Whereas the brigade rank structure, uh, the brigade commander, we had a brigade commander, we had battalion commanders, we had regimental commanders, company commanders, squad leaders, that was the rank structure within the brigade. Um, the class officers were separate from that. So, yeah, but the focus of the class officers is really looking ahead after graduation to keep the, the alumni together, the, cla the class together as, as alumni. Yeah, yeah. But I did do other things, like for, um, uh, for example, when I was a senior, first class, uh, so as a senior at the Naval Academy, you're a first class midshipman. That's the, the title, the rank. Um, women were admitted. That was the first year women were admitted. So as class president, I was uh, involved uh, somewhat with how we're going to integrate, you know, from student input and what the brigade should do. So between me and then the brigade structure, those, those brigade officers, we kind of made some recommendations from the student point of view to the officers, you know, the oh. naval officers running the Naval Academy you know, what should we look out for, how, how is this going to work, um, and that they, obviously, they made the policies, and then, but, and then we had to implement them from, a, from the student perspective, yeah. Okay. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, looking back, what do you mostly remember from your time there? At the Naval Academy? Um, wrestling, and uh, my, quite frankly, my struggles academically. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, um, yeah, just, and then just persevering and getting through. And then graduation was a, was a big thing. So, yeah, uh, um, that's a pretty vivid memory for me, is, mm -hmm. is graduating. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then you, make, you make some great friends there. Um, so you, you really need a support structure to get through. Mm -hmm. So um, a, peer, a peer support structure. So I have some really good friends still to this day. Uh, one of my good friends I also went to high school with. So it was, it was great that you know, we went to high school together at Seton Hall Prep, then it ended up at the Naval Academy together. Yeah. Hmm. And then you went into Naval Aviation Training Command? Right. Uh, so that the, everybody that goes into Naval Aviation starts at Pensacola, uh, Florida, and um, then you move on from there. So everybody starts at the same point, and then at a certain point in your training, you're shipped off to other uh, locations, other naval air stations for follow-on training, whether it's for jets, or helicopters, or for me, in my case, was prop-driven aircraft. So I went from Pensacola over to Corpus Christi, Texas. And Milton, Florida? Well, Mil um, yeah, Pensacola is primarily some ground school, and they do the naval the naval flight officers train there. Now, I don't know what it is. It's a long time ago when I was going through. Uh, this is in '79. Now um, the naval flight officers who are NFOs, they're the, sort of the fighter guys that in the back seat, or in my aircraft, the P3. They ran the anti-submarine warfare, the ASW problem. Um, <clears throat> they stayed at Pensacola. Milton, Florida is an outlying air station. I don't know, it was maybe about 20 miles from Pensacola. That's where we actually flew. So Pensacola, you, uh, I'm assuming you know about the Blue Angels. Okay. Yeah, the Blue Angels are based there in Pensacola. That's where they practice. Okay. And then you mentioned Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. So Corpus Christi, Texas is the primary site for training uh, for prop-driven aircraft. And so I did most of my flying there and then got my wings, completed flight training in August of 79, I think it was, and that's where I completed my flight training. Um, 
So when you get your wings, there's a ceremony, and does your family come to that? Yeah, my, well, I just got married in June of 79, so my wife was there, and uh, my younger brother and sister came. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. But yeah, there, there is a ceremony for that. Yeah. Nice. And then uh, Moffitt Fields, California? Right. Uh, so after you get your wings, you go to uh, what's called the Fleet Replacement Squadron. And that's where you learn how to fly and operate the aircraft you're going to be in for the rest of your career, however long that, that may be. So fighters, uh, fighter pilots go to Oceana, Virginia, or Lemoore, California, again, when I was in. Um, uh, for P-3s, the P-3 Orion aircraft, we had two locations, one at Moffett Field, California, which is in the Bay Area, and the other one was in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, since all that happened, BRAC has happened, so the base realignment and closure. So Moffett Field, where I did a number of squadron assignments, uh, is no longer open. That's closed. So, unfortunately. Um, let's talk about your um, your training on the uh, or your flying on the PC three. P I'm sorry. P yeah, P three C Orion, Orion yeah. aircraft. The and training aspect, or just the the operational flying. Operational, and also your opinion <coughs> of it. Um, well, it's an old an old aircraft. Um, its first real notable operational mission was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh. So it dates back a long time. Now as the years go by in, in naval aviation and same thing with Army helos, they're upgraded. So the P-3A was the aircraft flying during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then came the Bravo, the B version, and then I flew the C version, and there were even updates to the C version. So there was an aircraft called the P-3C Update 3, which had various avionics and computer modifications to it. But the basic airframe uh, is a Lockheed Electra the commercial version of the Lockheed Electra aircraft. The Navy got that and Lockheed modified it to become a naval aircraft. Today, you know, 2019, the Navy, the, the maritime patrol community is flying a Boeing 737, which is the P-8 Poseidon. So again, DOD and the Navy, they partner with Boeing and a lot of other DOD contractors and bought the 737 airframe and Boeing modified it to become this new maritime patrol aircraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I was flying, you know, when I was a young aviator, it was the Lockheed Electra. Now it's the Boeing 737. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. How did you like it, flying it? Oh, I loved it. And one of the things I really liked about it um, was the, whole, the crew concept. Uh, there's a crew of 12 on the aircraft. Uh, for an operational mission, there are three pilots, two flight engineers, a TACO, who is the tactical coordinator, a navigator, uh, three sensor operators, so two acoustic sensor operators and one non-acoustic sensor operator, an in-flight technician, and an ordnance man. So the as a young lieutenant, uh, mission commander, there's a lot of responsibility uh, to, to ensure that not only the flight safety, your safety of flight, um, but the mission accomplishment. And, you know, you're responsible for 11 other people. Right. Yeah. So that, I, that was very rewarding. That's what I really enjoyed the most, was that whole crew concept. Yeah. Why? Um, well, I really think it developed my leadership skills um, because you got five officers, you know, myself and four other officers, plus you have eight enlisted personnel. 
that you're responsible for, so you have to make them work together. And they come from diverse backgrounds. Um, for example, I had one crew member who was a little bit older. Before he joined the Navy, he was a bounty hunter. Literally, you know, he went out and looked for fugitives. Mm -hmm. And he had some different ideas about <laughs> how to do things. So to try to, you know, get him to do his job in accordance with, mm -hmm. you know, Navy standards rather than his own... Rule breaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, I had another guy who was a great sailor, and he was a uh, recreational parachutist. And he had... Wow, he was a master jumper. I mean, that's how many jumps he had. He loved to jump out of airplanes. We were on deployment one time in the Philippines, and we were doing an exercise with the SEALs and EOD. And they, had a, they just had to get some jumps. And they never jumped out of a P3 before. So they wanted to, um, they asked our squadron if they could do that, and we coordinated. And, my crew got selected to take these guys up to jump. So we just went up by QB Point, <clears throat> which, is the air, which was the airfield in the Philippines. Um, and we're just orbiting over the water. And we went through all these procedures to open the main cabin door and get these SEALs and EOD guys ready to jump out of the plane. Unbeknownst to me, my crew member, this guy I was referring to as a jumper, he brought his parachute with him on the flight. Mm. And he wanted, a, he wanted to jump out with them into mm. the water. And that was, um, yeah, that was, got a little dicey. Um, so it ended you at, at, to go at AWOL? No, no, not that. He, he wanted the experience of jumping out of a P3 into mm. water. Yeah. And you know, looking back on it now, it's a little bit humorous, but at the time, you know, it really concerned me and it got my blood pressure up a little bit, but yeah. So if, I, you know, I remember these sea stories, um, but really it's, it's about, as a young officer, it's really developing your relationship with, um, with all different ranks and, mm -hmm. you know, really trying to develop those leadership skills. Yeah. That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some different jobs you had were flight engineer branch officer, right. ordnance branch officer, nuclear safety officer, yep. pilot naval, N yeah, na NATOPS, NATOPS yeah. officer, yeah. Yeah. naval technician proficiency inspection coordinator, yeah. pilot in command and mission commander, I think that's kind of what you were describing, right, right. instructor pilot, do you want to talk about any... Sure. When, it's like any organization, whether it's the private sector or the military, as the new person, you're given an entry-level job. Mm -hmm. So a, a branch in the maintenance department of a squadron, that's the smallest organizational unit. So my first job was uh, to be the ordnance branch officer. So the, the sailors in the ordnance branch took care of the sauna buoys uh, in the P3 aircraft. Those, the sauna buoys is what we dropped out of the aircraft to search for um, Soviet submarines. And we could talk about the ASW problem maybe a little bit as well. <clears throat> um, so and they also took care, we also had weapons, P3, um, had mines, mining, defensive mining was one of our primary missions. We also carried torpedoes, um, and um, and the sauna buoys. Um, can you pause it for a second? Yeah. yeah so uh, so those are the ordnance men, and then then the flight engineers um, were all air crew, so they flew with us and. That was a great job for me as a young pilot because they know the aircraft systems inside and out. So as a pilot, I learned a lot from them about the aircraft systems and you know our normal and emergency procedures. Uh, then after that, um, this the NATOPS officer, the Na Naval Aviation Training Operations Procedures and Standardization. And it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, NATOPS, the NATOPS program goes way back, I think, 
maybe even to the 50s, early 60s, um, the Navy and Marine Corps had a very high accident rate. And the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant of the Marine Corps said, okay, we need to fix this. And the fix was to come up with standardized procedures that everybody follows, normal procedures and emergency procedures. And that brought the accident rate way down. So as the pilot NATOPS officer, you're, the, you're, you're really establishing the bar for all the other pilots to follow. And you administer the tests, the NATOPS tests, you administer check, right, check flights um, to make sure that all the pilots are adhering to the NATOPS manual. Yeah. So that was a great job. That was a great job for me. Yeah. And as an instructor pilot, do you have yeah. memories of any missions? Not missions, but flights um, in particular? No, I did so many uh, training flights. Um, and they all went smoothly? No. <laughs> Un unfortunately, some pilots struggle uh, with certain things. You know, we practice simulated. We practice three engine landings and two engine landings, all simulated. All four engines are always running. Uh, but we pull them back to idle, what's called flight idle, just pull, and so you're only, the pilot under instruction can only use three or two engines to land the airplane. And some pilots take some longer than others to figure that out. So, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's very rewarding when you see the light come on and the, the guy you're training, you know, gets it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that, that is very re rewarding. And then the other aspect, again, for a young lieutenant, is the interface you have with the commanding officer. Because the commanding officer is, is very concerned about safety of flight issues. So if a pilot is struggling, he wants to know about it. And the commanding officer would come to me and say, why isn't you know, so-and-so performing well? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. so they might wash out? Um, that's a rarity. Uh, that's called a Fleet Naval Aviation Review Board or FNAV board. Um, and I, as a, as a commanding officer myself of VP-10 uh, in Brunswick, I unfortunately I did have to um, kick one guy out. Oh. Yeah, he just he shouldn't have gotten. He should have never even gotten to a squadron. Uh, oh. To be quite honest, um, yeah, and, for, and so I flew with him a bunch of times as the CEO, not a bunch, a, a, enough, to, I flew with him enough times to know that he would not make it as a pilot in command. And if he can't make it as the pilot in command, then the Navy doesn't need you. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a, he had a resign. Yeah. And so that was hard, that was hard, but it was, right. it was necessary. It wasn't your fault that he even made it to the squadron. Right, yeah. Right? All right, so you had some deployments, some Westpac deployments? Correct, the Western Pacific, yeah. Primarily, I'm a, quote, Westpac sailor, primarily, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all my, um, most of my deployments in the squadron, P3 squadrons and you know, on the, the ship, the Carl Vinson, um, were all to the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. So for the squadron deployments, Misawa, Japan, uh, the Philippines, QB Point in the Philippines, and uh, Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, um, plus detachments all over the place, exercises. Do you have any stories from those? Um, yeah, finding Soviet submarines is pretty re rewarding. Um, it's, uh, what do you do when you find them? Do you take photos? Um, if they're on the surface, sure. Um, and ASW, or anti-submarine warfare, is just as much an art as it is a science. And the crew coordination is really important. So again, going back to my earlier comment about why I enjoyed my time in the P3 community so much was working with the crew. So you're relying on everybody, not relying on, everybody has to do their job in order to uh, have a successful mission. So, um, in very broad 
strokes, the 10,000 foot overview, so to speak, of the ASW problem is search, localization, track, and then if we were in a hot war, it would be attack. So, and um, flying out of Moffett Field, California during the Cold War, you know, we'd fly out a thousand miles from California to look for one Soviet submarine in the middle of the Pacific. Now, it's just not us. There's a whole intelligence community out there who contributes to the ASW problem. It's not just the P3s. There are other intelligence assets that, that, we're, that we coordinate with. Um, so you asked a specific example. Um, my second deployment to Misawa. There was a, to Misawa, Japan, yeah. There was a big exercise in the Sea of Japan. Um, two carrier battle groups. Um, and so the Soviets are very interested in monitoring what we do and how we train and how we exercise. So they were, they had bare aircraft up flying around looking at the carriers. What does that mean, bare aircraft? Uh, that's the NATO designation for one of the big Soviet uh, prop driven aircraft. Um, so they had bare aircraft up there flying, and uh, it was me, my crew, and that our squadron commanding officer decided to come flying with us that day. So we're out there, we knew there were Soviet aircraft in the area, so that was a safety concern for me, uh, because I don't know what they're gonna do. Plus, we're looking for Soviet submarines monitoring the carrier. So they, to the Soviets take the opportunity, or took, you know, maybe, maybe we should be using past tense on all this, but, um, they took the opportunity to track our carriers. So their submarines, their fast attack submarines, were tracking our aircraft carriers. So again, they would use it for training too. So if we ever got into a shooting war with the Soviets, they would know how to attack our aircraft carriers. So again, it's this cat and mouse game. Right. Which is uh, what the Cold War was. Sure, sure, sure. But this particular mission, we ended up finding two different Soviet submarines. So we thought there was just one out there, we ended up finding two. So that was, that was very memorable. And you know, not only did we find two submarines, but the squadron commanding officer was on the flight with us, so he was pretty happy about that. So yeah. how deep were they? How deep were they? That I don't remember. So is it something that you see, or is it radar? No, no, okay, so we'll go back to the sauna buoys. Um, we, we had two different kinds of sauna buoys, passive detection and active. So a passive sauna buoy is dropped into the water um, and we could set the depth of a microphone. So it's a salt water activated battery. So when the sauna buoy hits the water, the salt water activated battery turns on and a microphone drops, or a hydrophone I should say, more accurately, a hydrophone drops into the water and it goes down to a certain depth that's, that's preset. So we could carry 84 sauna buoys. And they listen, so the passive sauna buoy, this passive hydrophone listens for noise in the water. So anything driven by machinery, a submarine, is gonna put out noise in the water. And we can detect that noise. And the acoustic sensor operators on the aircraft are trained to know what to listen for, plus the sauna buoy is transmitting a signal back to the airplane. And it comes out on a graph. For us, anyway, I don't know what the, the new P-8 Poseidon does. I haven't had the opportunity to be on one yet. I want to, but I haven't gotten there yet. But for us, it was a paper, like a, almost like a graph. So a, a paper uh, needle would go back and forth and it would detect the frequency of the noise that the hydrophone was picking up. And the, the sensor operators, the acoustic sensor operators were trained to know this is a main coolant pump 
of a Soviet Akula class submarine or a Delta IV submarine. So they knew all that. And that's, and, the, and when I talk about art and science, um, oceanography comes into play. So pressure, temperature, and salinity of the water was really important for sound propagation. But the submarine knows that too. So they know the best depth to avoid being detected. And we try to put the hydrophones, the sonobuoys, at a depth where we have the best chance of detecting the submarine. So then, so the search phase is just trying to get a picture, a big picture of where the submarine might be. Then the localization is refining that. And then tracking it, is, tracking the submarine is, you, you know, course and speed until you can drop a torpedo on it. So it gets, it gets pretty involved, it gets pretty complicated. So that's what your aircraft does? You drop torpedoes on submarines? Well, if we were in a hot shooting war, we would, but we've never. The okay. United States has never attacked a Soviet submarine. That's, yeah. I yeah, 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 no, no. And the only time we've ever carried torpedoes is during uh, a readiness training event. Where, so part of, you know, everybody, all, all the services have a readiness standard you have to meet for uh, personnel, unit personnel, you have to have the right bodies in the right jobs at the right pay grade, the right level of experience. You have to have material conditions, so you have to have all your airplanes ready to go. And then you have to have the training aspect. So three big chunks of that readiness program. So one of our readiness qualifications was dropping a torpedo on a target. So we'd go to Hawaii, uh, the island of Kauai had a range and they put a, they called it a sled. They put a sled in the water, it had a pre-programmed course that it would run and we had to go in, we had to find it, we had to tra localize it, we had to track it and then we had to drop our training torpedo on it. And all crews had to do that. Okay. So, but, but no, I just want to be perfectly clear that we've never Dro actually dropped a live torpedo on any Soviet submarine. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, also, did we already talk about Diego Garcia, British uh, Indian Ocean Territory? Right. Uh, we, um, that was a detachment site. So the squadron was either deployed to either um, Misawa, Japan, QB Point in the Philippines, or Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa. Oh, okay. Um, and the, the squadrons would, the squadrons that were deployed to those three primary sites would support the detachment in Diego Garcia. And the primary role, our primary role in Diego Garcia was to support the carrier, the aircraft carrier battle group that was deployed to the Indian Ocean. So go back to this cat and mouse, the Soviets would deploy their submarines to trail our carrier battle groups mm -hmm. to, all the way through to the Indian Ocean. So we would go out there and, and make sure that they weren't around or we would track them. Yeah, but the Indian Ocean is a big place. So we would, the, our model was if we weren't flying in, in and out of Diego Garcia, we would end up going Diego Garcia to Mogadishu, Somalia, uh, which was interesting, um, interesting place to go. Um, and then you actually landed there and stayed there. Uh, yeah. What was happening there? Well, this was before. Black Hawk Down. Black, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is in the 80s, the early to mid 80s. And before they were pirates? Uh, and, let's see, no, I went there, the last time I was there was, let me see, 89? I think 89. But still, I was before the UN. President Clinton. Yeah, before the UN peacekeeping force in there, yeah. So we would go, Diego Garcia, Mogadishu, Somalia. We had support from the embassy there. Um, we'd stay in a house 
that the embassy owned, and I use the term house very loosely, we, we had to bring in our own food and water. There was no running water, um, and you wouldn't want to drink it anyway. And we had to bring in our own food. So really, the embassy owned the house, and they kept our classified material overnight. And so we'd, we'd fly from Diego Garcia, do a mission, a, a battle group support mission, then land in Mogadishu. The next day we'd get up, fly another mission, but we'd land in Muscat, Oman. Stay overnight Can you spell in that? Muscat, M U S C A T. Oh, okay. And Oman, yeah, the country of Oman, yeah. Was, so we had an air base in Somalia, or that was just a. No, airport? it was the international airport. Oh, okay. So that was one of the things the State Department did. You know, the State Department and DOD working together to get permission for us to mm -hmm. um, land land there and stay overnight. And at DOD would pay all the airport fees and everything, mm -hmm. and the fuel costs. And the same thing with Muscat was that we landed at the international airport. What about? Let's talk about Alaska and Midway. Midway. Um, yeah. Um, Classified missions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Both Alaska too. No, Alaska, uh, Adak, Alaska is island out in western Aleutian Islands, and we go out there and just do our primary ASW mission out of there, looking for Soviet submarines. So between, so geography plays a real important role here. Um, on the west coast, we had. Base P3s flying out of Moffett Field, California. The reserves had squadrons in Whidbey Island, Washington. Then we had a squadron, we had aircraft in Adak, Alaska, and squadrons in Hawaii, Barbers Point, Hawaii. So we could cover the Pacific, but plus the, then plus the deployed sites, so Japan. Um, so we could cover the Pacific that way from all those different sites. On the East Coast, we had Jacksonville, Florida, Brunswick, Maine, Bermuda, then further east into Europe, we flew out of Iceland, Keflavik, Iceland, um, lodges in Portugal. Um, you did? Well, P3s, not me, not oh, me right. personally. So we could cover the Atlantic that way, mm -hmm. all the way down into the Caribbean. And we also had, uh, in Puerto Rico, Roosevelt Roads, Air Station, Naval Air Station in Puerto Rico. So that way, so again, back to geography, we can cover from the Caribbean all the way up to Iceland on the East Coast and from Alaska all the way down to the Philippines in the Pacific. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about instructional systems, subject matter experts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so after my first squadron tour, VP-47 at Moffett Field. I went really just across the field and became an instructor pilot for the fleet replacement squadron. So I was teaching new aviators how to fly the P-3. So it was what I had just been through three years prior. Now I'm teaching the new, the new aviators how to fly the P-3. Great, that was a great assignment. I really like that. Um, On a personal note, yes. I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. while you're doing all of this traveling mm -hmm. in the Pacific yeah. regions, uh, your wife is staying put in California? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, just like all military families, you know, it takes, it's a team effort. And my, wife's, my wife was great during my 24 years of active duty. She really, yeah, she's a rock. Uh, mm -hmm. And on top of that, she's a professional person, so she worked. And we had three kids, and she worked uh, almost all that time. I mean, she took some time off during pregnancy and delivery, and for the she got uh, you know a couple months off. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, yeah, she worked and raised our kids, and even when I was deployed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So I owe I owe her a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more than I could say. Uh -huh. And I'm sure I echo what a lot of other military 
right. families they, go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's an assistant pilot model manager? Yeah, it's, so uh, VP thirty one, Patrol Squadron thirty one was the the fleet replacement squadron on the west coast, and the commanding officer of that squadron had uh, another title as the model, the P three model manager, and what that means for naval aircraft is that you are basically in charge of standardization for the whole P three community. And so not only the pilots and the flight engineers, but all the crew members in the back too. So every, every position in the aircraft, the pilots, the flight engineers, the tactical coordinators, the navigators, all the sensor operators, the in-flight technicians and the ordnance mid had a standardization person in that squadron. So we would go out and test and evaluate every squadron on the west coast. And then there's a fleet VP-30 was the fleet replacement squadron on the East Coast in Jacksonville. And they were in charge of the squadrons on the East Coast. So we, every squadron got evaluated once a year. So we would go, we'd give a written test, a closed book test, an open book test. And then uh, three, three? Yeah, for me, it was three pilots and three flight engineers would get evaluated in the aircraft, like a check ride to make sure the squadron was standardized. And you had, to, the squadron had to pass. You have to pass this, this evaluation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, I mean, that gets to be some pressure. When did you, um, I don't know why you made me think of this. Yeah. When did you go for your masters? When? Uh, after my command tour, VP-10, 95 to 96. Oh, okay. Yeah, so later on. Because it seems like you're passing tests when, in college, you weren't really into studying, maybe? Or you weren't well, doing as well? Um, it seems like you're excelling in the Navy yeah, with yeah, what yeah, you yeah, are yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, I don't, um, yeah, I, I work my butt off academically at the Naval Academy. It's just that um, the Naval Academy That's is a STEM, it's a STEM institution. You know, and engineering and, you know, just was really never my strong suit. But I took, you, you had to take, you had to take physics, you had to take chemistry, you had to take calculus, you had to take electrical engineering, you had to take thermodynamics. All these courses, oh, I, I mean, I might as well have been an engineer for all the engineering courses. Oh, I didn't I, understand that. That's good that you pointed that out. Yeah, okay. so my, my academic major was international security affairs, you right. know, political science. Right. But I'm taking all these other STEM courses, and mm -hmm. that, that's where I really, my majors, my academic major, my undergraduate degree, my majors, I excelled. I got A's and you know, right. B pluses. It was the, the STEM courses that I really had a, had a tough time in. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the carrier's name was USS Carl Vinson. And right. that was out of Alameda, California. Yeah, yeah. so uh, on a personal note, um, we were fortunate, my, my wife, my family and I, my first squadron assignment was at Moffett Field. Then I became an instructor pilot. I'm still at Moffett Field. Then when I went to the Carl Vinson um, at Alameda, my commute, was longer, but we didn't have to move because Alameda is in the North Bay, San Francisco Bay, but the North Bay up near Oakland. Moffett Fields is at the southern end of the bay near San Jose. So we were fortunate enough as a military family where I didn't have to move, or we didn't have to move, but my commute was just long. So, mm -hmm. so that worked out. And my wife worked at Santa Clara University so she could keep her job. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that worked out. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. And are you familiar with the sea shore rotation that the Navy has? Sea duty, shore duty kind of thing? So, so my first squadron, VP-47, was sea duty, where you go on deployments. Then your next assignment is shore duty, where you, you're land-based, you stay home. Oh, okay. okay. Then I went from VP-31, 
shore duty back to sea duty on the Carl Vincent. And I should probably explain something there. Um, the Navy also has a sort of a philosophy for officers to have a what's called a disassociated sea tour where you do something different than your primary warfare specialty. So my primary warfare specialty was aviation. I was an avi a pilot, an aviator. On the Carl Vinson, I did something completely different. I was the ship's assistant navigator, ship's company. I was not part of the air wing. I didn't fly off of the carrier. I was not part of the air wing. I was ship's company as assistant navigator. So that was my disassociated sea tour as a lieutenant commander in 04. Officer of the deck, sea yeah, and anchor right. detail officer of the deck. Right. Conning officer while conning alongside during underway. Replenishment, yep. right. yeah. Honors and ceremonies officer, protocol officer, yeah. assistant command duty officer in port. Right, in, in yeah, port. yeah. And then deploy, uh, another WISPAC deployment. Two deployments, and, yeah. Yeah, in Tino. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I, that was a really, really hard job. Navigating? Assistant navigator. It was a really, and very demanding. I mean, the operational tempo of the ship was very high. Uh, and just my job, I mean, if, if I got four hours of sleep a night. I was going to say, how many navigators yeah. are there on a ship at a time? Um, well, two. There's the, the navigator, the ship's navigator, and the assistant navigator. But we have co what called quartermasters. So different, different than the Army. Army quartermasters are logisticians, basically. Um, the Navy quartermasters are do the navigation. So we oh, had okay. an enlisted, enlisted quartermasters who would do the sort of the nuts and bolts and technical things of navigating the ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, um, the assistant navigator is a very demanding billet, very demanding assignment. You're doing so much uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then your next shore duty until 91, you were sea I did not, yeah, uh, back to the seashore rotation. Oh. Yeah, I went from sea duty on the Carl Vinson to sea duty to another squadron. Yeah, I did not have shore duty. Oh, okay. And that so was you just... stayed on the Carl Vinson? No, I went to another squadron. I went to another P3 squadron. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that a, a different ship then? No, well... Um, so the Carl Vinson's aircraft carrier, right? And um, yeah, let me let me tell you. Yeah, you asked about some highlights. Uh, I do have one highlight from that I'd like to point out. Um, we were it was my first deployment on the ship. We were coming back from deployment, and on the way from Westpac, on the way back to the United States, we went up into the Bering Sea. This is in January. And it was really, uh, looking back on it, it was really evaluating how a carrier battle group can operate in the Bering Sea and in and around all these different islands to protect and maybe use the islands as sort of a barrier between the battle group and possible Soviet either surface ships or submarines. But what really sticks out for me was the weather and flying in that weather. Um, I mean, there were like, we were fly up there flying some days where there were 50 knots of wind over the flight deck. Visibility was very low. And you got these 19, 20 year old kids working on the flight deck, trying to get the aircraft ready to fly. And so you have those sailors working, working their butts off in that environment and that weather. Mm -hmm on that flight deck, and then you have the aviators, the pilots, the fighter pilots flying in that weather. Mm -hmm. And they just did a superhuman job. I mean, I will never forget that as long as I live. I mean, it was really, and, and we had a commanding officer who was pretty tough. I mean, he was, he was hard. He was really hard to get along with. Mm -hmm. And, but the air wing, 
the, the, the sailors on the flight deck and, and the pilots, I mean, it was very impressive. I'll, I will never forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So after the Carl Vinson, I, we have, like the Army has assignment officers for, you know, to, to work with, uh, you know, people, with, with soldiers to get them into certain jobs. They work, you know, it's their personnel people. Um, are the Navy equivalent of that is called detailers. My detailer told me that I really didn't have time uh, to, do shore duty. to do shore duty because of my career progression right. that I was going to make 05, you know, not in not so many years. And I had to get back to my department head tour, my department head squadron assignment. So he said, no shore duty for you. You're going right back to another fleet P3 squadron. So V that was VP50. I'm off the field. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I was a safety officer and then the maintenance officer. Right. Yeah. Now. And that brings us up to Desert Storm. Yeah. Um, we we rotated back from deployment right before Desert Storm. So the squadron that came over right after us was overseas. So I, we missed Desert Storm by one deployment cycle. So the squadron that came and relieved us um, was there during during Desert Storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now there's a couple of big highlights in my career and this is the first one was mm -hmm. the aircraft accident in Mar March 21st of 1991 and I have some information in the car on this that you might want to look at okay so um, flying at a Moffett Field we flew frequently, all the squadrons did, flew down to San Diego off the coast um, and did exercises with the carrier battle groups stationed at Naval Base San Diego. Third, it's, everybody calls it 32nd Street, but it's the big, big Naval Base in San Diego. And as part of the training cycle, uh, the Navy term is workups. You're, you're working up, you're getting ready to go on deployment. So everything you do, everything a na naval unit does at home is in preparation to go on deployment. That's the focus. Everything you do, the pilot training, the torpedo exercises I talked about, carrier air wings, doing flight training, it's all in preparation to go on deployment. So we would do exercises all the time with the carrier battle group uh, out off the southern coast of California and and we had US submarines they would play the bad guys and we have to go and track them and um, so in uh, early, the early morning hours of March 21st 1991 two of my squadron P3s from VP50 had a mid-air collision 20, we lost 27 people oh my gosh yeah in a heartbeat so sorry yeah, that was really tough. That was tough for the whole P3 community. Um, did you have to alert the families? I did. One, a spouse, one wife. Oh, okay. I did. Now, I was a maintenance, I was a 04. The commanding officer is an 05 as a commander. You know, he's in charge, but, um, but yeah, so he, you know, I got picked to go notify one of the spouses. Mm -hmm. That was hard. That was really hard. Something you never forget, I imagine. Oh, yeah, never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it was early in the morning. The air, the collision took place about 2.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. By the time we got sent out, it was maybe 7-ish. Uh, she was a flight attendant. And I knock on the door and no answer. And I'm, initially I'm thinking, oh my God, she's away on a trip, you know, working as a flight attendant and she's gonna see this on the news. Mm -hmm. 
but she was home, but she just wouldn't, wasn't answering the door. She was afraid. She knew why I was there. No one knocks on her door at seven in the morning. In uniform. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, but finally, she I was walking away and she came to the door. Were you by yourself? No, fortunately, um, we had a, a woman intelligence officer in the squadron and she came with me. Oh, okay. And that was a big help. That mm -hmm. was a big help, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's something I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, two other pieces to that was there, um, uh, anytime there's an aircraft accident, there's a safety investigation and there's a legal investigation. So they're parallel investigations, but they're separate. Mm -hmm. And each group of investigators can interview the same witnesses multiple times if they want, mm -hmm. but their objectives are different. Like the safety investigation is, you know, trying to figure out what happened and, and coming up with procedures so this will never happen again. Mm -hmm. The legal investigation is to de determine culpability, mm -hmm. line of duty misconduct, anything like that, you know. Um, but since I was an instructor pilot, I was asked lots of questions from the safety side about the pilots. Because the, the two pilots in command in particular, I mean, I trained both of those guys. So the safety investigators were looking through all of their their training records and all their do the documentation of the training records and were asking me about the flights that I did with them. Yeah. So that was that was hard. That was an eye opener for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you got some said, got some pretty pointed questions. Oh yeah. yeah. But but the again the objective is why did this happen and how do we prevent it from happening again? You had said it was the nurse worst naval air crash in decades. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Then, then we had a ceremony, you know, memorial service at Moffett Field. But then after that, the CO, the squadron commanding officer, came to me and wanted me to be the first flight back in the air for the squadron because after the accident. We didn't fly. I mean, we stopped flying. Um, the above the commanding officer is a uh, who's a commander in 05. Above him is the commodore, the wing commander, who's in 06, the navy captain. And he said, "Okay, VP 50, you're not flying. You're done. You're stopped flying for a while until we figure out, you know, what's going on here." Um, yeah. So after I don't remember how many days it was, we didn't fly, but the the squadron CEO came to me and said, Tom, I want you to take up a couple of guys and just go out and do a couple of touch and goes. So that was a little bit of pressure on me mm -hmm. too to be the first first crew back in the air. Mm -hmm. yeah. Must have been very emotional. Very, very emotional, very emotional. So it had been a relatively routine exercise? Yes, yeah. That they've been doing for years? Yes, yeah. How old were they, the pilots? They were both lieutenants. The, well, the pilots in command. They were both lieutenants, so late twenties. Neither neither one was the mission commander. They had uh, both aircraft. Both crews had lieutenant commanders. Had O fours, tactical coordinators, and the tactical coordinator was the mission commander. But the pilots in command of the aircraft were lieutenants. And it occurred as one plane flew to relieve the other on station. Mm -hmm. And it occurred in marginal weather. What does that mean? Um, yeah, it was cloudy and rainy and layers, different layers, uh -huh. you know. Um, it wasn't, the P-3 is a very sturdy aircraft. I mean, I've been in some pretty, pretty nasty weather. Mm -hmm. And airplane holds up just fine. Um, so it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't terrible weather. It was just so it wasn't clear. And I guess the safety investigation showed nothing wrong with the aircraft? Mm -hmm. And what did no. the other investigation show? The legal investigation? Yes, yeah, same. But for an aircraft, for an accident like that, you, you, it's hard to come up with 
100% certainty of a causal factor. Yeah. So there was no known cause? Undetermined. Yeah. Right. There's you know, speculation about lookout doctrine. So people, I mean, the crew, the pilots actually looking outside, you know, what was their lookout doctrine like? You know, were they, you know, what was the weather? But if you have a, you could have a great lookout doctrine, but if you're in the clouds, you're not gonna see, you necessarily see the other aircraft. So what other factors went into the collision? Um, yeah, and all that was never determined with 100% certainty. But in, generally speaking, in aviation accidents, there's a chain of events that happen. And so it's never, I shouldn't say never, it's almost never just one thing. It's a chain of events. And if you break one link in that chain, the accident may not happen. Um, so, Can so you give an knows? example of what you're saying? Let's say, let's say in a squad, any kind of any kind of squadron, helicopter squadron, fighter squadron, P3 squadron, uh, somebody's doing a maintenance action on an engine, and they inadvertently leave a tool in there in the in the engine. Well, there's very strict uh, tool control policies in squadrons. So you have a toolbox. If Carol is the maintenance technician, you go to the tool room and you physically check out a toolbox. You say, I need a toolbox to do this engine repair. And you get a standard toolbox. You open it with the person that's give, issuing you the toolbox. And you inspect it and say, all the tools are there. Yes, all the tools are there. You sign for the toolbox. You take the toolbox out and you do your maintenance action. When you come back in, all the tools are supposed to be there. So you give the toolbox, oh, but let's back up. There's also a quality assurance inspection. So Carol does the, the maintenance action and then Joan comes out and she's the quality assurance technician. She inspects your work. Then the toolbox gets returned to the tool room. But was it, was the toolbox opened? Was it inspected? Were all the tools accounted for? Well, in this particular case, no. The pilots go out to start the engine. There are the tools in there. And does they start, as they start the engine, it does some additional damage to the engine. So in terms of chain of events, the quality insurance inspector, Joan, should have checked the toolbox should have looked in the area you were working in to complete the maintenance action and may have seen the tool lying in the engine. And then you and the tool room person should have opened the toolbox at the end of the job and inspected the toolbox to That's ensure- That's a good the example, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on then. Yeah. <laughs> you went to the Pentagon. Joint staff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a great, that, my time as the assistant navigator on the Carl Vinson, I learned a lot about how the Navy operates in terms of a battle group unit. I learned a lot about the Navy in that job. Did your family move there? To where? To D, oh yeah, so back now, now to the Pentagon, yeah, we moved to the East Coast. So we moved from California to uh, Maryland, yeah. So uh, you were working there during the war, the first Gulf War? No, no it was over by then. Oh, it was over by then. It was over by then, yeah. But General Powell was still chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Yeah, he was still, Colin Powell was still so there. So this is so I time. So, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. This yeah, is the time of Operation Desert Calm that you mentioned? Desert Calm, right? Yeah. Mentioned? Oh no, you, that was 94, 95. Yeah. That was when we brought home our equipment from Kuwait. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that wasn't right after? No, that was VP-10. Okay, yeah. so I didn't mean to jump. Okay, yeah. All right, go yeah. back to Colin Powell. Yeah, yeah. So General Powell is the chairman 
of the Joint Chiefs. So I'm on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So you worked with him? Yeah. <laughs> Loosely speaking. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, me and 1,600 other staff officers. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was a, yeah, so my time on the Carl Vincent, I learned a lot about how the Navy operates. My time on the Joint Staff, I learned a lot about, obviously, how the Joint Staff functions, but not only that, but it was a real good introduction to me to DOD, I mean, big DOD, how DOD works, and the interagency process. So how the different federal departments are supposed to work together. What is the exercise branch? Yeah, so we, um, we ran the chairman's exercise program. And uh, most of the exercises were classified. Um, for example, I worked on a couple of exercises uh, that had to do with nuclear weapons. Uh, I worked on a big uh, mobilization exercise where we're mobilizing the whole government. Uh, worked on a couple of no-notice exercises where this is a very small group of exercise planners. We would develop this exercise. It would get approved by the chairman. It would get approved by General Powell. And then we would go to another uh, we would go to a, a selected sink. Are you familiar with the, the big uh, the operational commanders, the COCOMs, the, the operational mm -hmm. command, like the European Command, the Central Command, the Southern Command, Transportation Command, Special Operations Command. Mm -hmm. um, those are the big four star officers. Okay. We would go to their staff and say, We're here. This is a no-notice exercise as part of the chairman's exercise program. Here's the exercise scenario. That sounds like fun for you. Yeah, but not for them. Not for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. So one exercise we did um, was during Hurricane Andrew. And we thought it was going to get canceled, the exercise, because they had this huge hurricane in Florida. Right. But General Powell said, no, do it. Yeah, which was good. I mean, his comment was something to the effect that we should be able to do two things at the same time, you know, do this exercise and take care of a real, real world catastrophe. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, right. yeah. So yeah, so that was that was good. I really enjoyed that. I worked with some great officers, you know, other services. Uh, um, one in particular. Uh, can I mention names on here? Yeah. An Air Force Colonel, John Bell, who I worked for there. He was, he was great. Um, I, when we were in D.C. and, and we living in Maryland, my wife was going to the University of Maryland for her Ph.D. Mm -hmm. And I had three little kids, and she worked her butt off to get her doctorate. And um, before she completed her dissertation and defended her dissertation, I got transferred from the Joint Staff to Brunswick, Maine. Mm -hmm. So I could not come to her dissertation defense, but this, the guy I worked for, John Bell, this Air Force Colonel, he went, he went to my wife's dissertation defense. And I, and I, I always appreciated that. And my wife thought it was great too that he came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Very supportive. Yeah, he was, he was very supportive, yeah. yeah. So then she had to move up there? Uh, after she finished her Ph.D. work, yeah, uh, her and the kids, we moved up to Maine, yeah. So that was my, that was VP-10, that now is a year as executive officer and then a year as commanding officer. So in the, in Navy, in aviation units in the Navy and squadrons, the EXO, the executive officer, moves up to become commanding officer. Ships and submarines do it different. Um, you could be the XO, the executive officer of a ship for a year or two. You leave that ship, you go do something else. Then you get selected for command and you come back to a different ship. Squadrons don't do it that way. Squad, you're selected for command. You go to a squadron as the XO and then you move up to CO. 
Uh, it's just a different philosophy of how, between the warfare communities. And during this, uh, these years, how long were you gone and deployed to uh, yeah, Sicily? Yes, yeah, Sicily. That was, I did one, in those two years, just did one deployment. You said Sicily. as well as um, Saudi Arabia? There was a detachment to Saudi Arabia from Sigonella, Sicily. Oh, okay. One aircraft, sometimes two, but usually just one. And now that we were, that's the desert calm part. So we were flying in the Red Sea to make sure there were no um, UN sanctions violations in Iraq. Such as Scud missiles? Yeah, yeah. So we were monitoring the shipping in the Red Sea out of Jeddah, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Were there any episodes or incidents? No, no. So I looked up, Joe and I actually both did, Operation Desert Calm in the yeah. first Gulf War it's also called Operation Desert Farewell. It was the name given to the return of U.S. units and equipment home no, after the liberation I, of Kuwait. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, and it was also called um, Operation Peace Walker, too. And 18,000 troops, uh, U.S. Navy personnel, on U.S. warships or in the island nation of Bahrain. Yeah. And, and one was quoted as saying, it's the only war where we take this stuff home. Yeah. <laughs> And I wanted to ask your opinion if you thought that was due to the budgets were decreasing. Oh, bringing the equipment back home? Mm -hmm. Boy. That could just be maybe one reason. Yeah, there could be yeah, a number of reasons. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, Might have been maybe the Kuwaitis and the Bahrainis didn't want it. Maybe they said, we don't want this stuff taken home. I, <laughs> I, don't, know. I don't know. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but Bahrain now is the home of the U.S. Fifth Fleet. So the headquarters, a three-star admiral, is uh, mm -hmm. command uh, home of the fifth fleet. So, yeah. So during Operation Desert Calm, the MPs are no longer jumpy. Sleep is uninterrupted by <laughs> Scud missile attacks. <laughs> and they had a Cunard, is that how you say it? Luxury liner. Oh yeah, that Cunard. Was rented. Yeah. Cunard. Yeah, yeah. In Bahrain, where alcohol was allowed. Yeah. And then you walked in the door and I had to stop okay. my yeah. research. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I could send you those links. Yeah, I didn't know those other two names. Yeah. yeah. Just cool. know it by Desert Calm. Yeah. All right, so these years you also were in Operations Deny Flight and Sharp Guard. So yeah, so we had, a, we had a really, really, really busy deployment. Um, I think the only day we did not fly was the day of my chain of, change of command. When I went, when I came, became from X. When I went from XO to CO, we didn't fly. Then we flew every other day. So how long were you gone? Six, six months from that's, Maine. That's a six-month deployment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we we had the aircraft in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, but then deny flight and sharp guard. This is uh, we were flying in the Adriatic, and also doing overland intelligence collection. This is during the war in the Balkans, Yugoslavia, when Yugoslavia was breaking up. Mm. So Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, Bosnia, Montenegro. Wow. Yeah. So we were flying 24-7. And what was the typical mission? To, uh, was sa sanctions enforcement to make sure there was no contraband, you know, weapons and stuff going into, into the Balkans. Now, was uh, the other interesting piece about that was uh, this was that was a NATO mission. It wasn't just a U.S. mission; it was a NATO mission. So there were uh, Germans, Spanish, Portuguese, and U.S. air crews flying there. And they were all great. It was fun working with them. Oh, okay. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So that was my time. That was um, 
And you were flying Sig out of Sicily? Yeah, Sigonella, Sicily. NATO base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a joint, well, it's a joint, it was a, yeah, it was a, it's an Italian airfield, but it had, you know, we had a U.S. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why I'm thinking of this now compared yeah. to when we first began this interview, mm -hmm. but when your dad was Navy, where mm -hmm. was he? In the Pacific. Okay. Yeah. And on, now on here you are, Navy, yeah. and you're in the same place where our World War II guys, well, the Air Force oh. were, Italy, and they flew across the Adriatic. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah. something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, er, er, Earl, a little while ago, I talked about three big career milestones yes. for me, that the mid-air collision was one, right. being, being the CO of a squadron is the second. So, yeah, I mean, on a, pos that. on a positive note, yes. that is definitely the highlight of my career, being the commanding officer, being in charge, being responsible. Um, yeah, definitely. De definitely the most rewarding. Patrol Squadron 10. Yeah. Stationed at Naval Air Lancers. Station Brunswick, yep. Maine. A Navy Maritime Patrol Squadron flying the P-3C Orion aircraft, you were directly responsible for the combat readiness, professional performance, professional development, training and safety of over 300, 350 skilled and diverse sailors, both air crew and maintenance personnel. The squadron operated nine aircraft, each valued at $35 million, 1994 dollars. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much a P8 is. So how much would that be nowadays? I have no idea. I don't know how much a P8 is, the, the new aircraft, the P8 Poseidon, that 737 mm -hmm. aircraft I talked about. Yeah, I don't know how much those are. You led the squadron on an award-winning deployment to the Mediterranean Theater based out of Sigonella, Sicily. Yeah, we got a Navy, oh. Navy unit commendation for our deployment. Yeah. Did you put that down, do you know? That's on my DD. Two fourteen. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. The squadron exceeded all established goals. And we got an aviation safety award too. Yeah. That's important. Yeah, yeah. You brought everyone home. That's right. That's important. Yeah, my when I came to VP ten as the XO, um, all the whole squadron knew that I was in VP fifty when we had the midair. And I made it perfectly clear to them my emphasis on safety mm -hmm. and an adherence to NATOPS, the, the standardization procedures mm -hmm. that I talked about. Yeah, they, they knew up front that I would not tolerate any deviations on okay. safety. Yeah, so, so, but so it paid off. They were in good hands. Yeah. The squadron participated in numerous real world operations, including Operation Desert Calm, Operation Deny Flight. And Operation Sharp Guard, enforcing sanctions against the former Republic of Yugoslavia and several NATO sponsored bilateral and multinational exercises. VP 10 was recognized by the Chief of Naval Operations with two consecutive aviation safety awards and a Navy unit commendation for operational excellence. The squadron consistently achieved a 99% operations and production rate on an annual operating budget exceeding four million dollars and most of that's fuel to be honest with you wow yeah the squadron was directly involved in completing the modification of 18 aircraft requiring comprehensive training for air crew and maintenance personnel VP 10 was also recognized for the highest promotion of its sailors among four squadrons at Naval Air Station Brunswick Maine so are we ready to talk about before retiring? Sure. Okay. You served on the Navy staff in two capacities, one as a special assistant to the Chief of Naval Operations for Joint Chief Staff Matters, Naval Plan Navy Planner. Planner, yeah. So all the services have planners, and that's kind of the, I guess the nom de guerre, the nickname for the, the staff. There's usually a staff of four or five officers, I guess, depending on the service. And they, they directly support the service chief. So the Army has Army planners, Navy has Navy planners, Air Force has planners. So one of the, um, after, you familiar with the Goldwater-Nichols Act, 1986 Goldwater-Nichols Act? No, 
I don't remember that. Yeah, um, well, look, I don't want to digress, but it, one of the things it did was it designated the chairman of the Joint Chiefs as the primary military advisor to the president and the secretary of defense. And the service chiefs, their role as members of the jo Joint Chiefs, that's their primary job. So if there's a, let's say the CNO has a meeting, but there's also a meeting with the chairman, the, the Joint Staff, the, that has priority. So it elevated the, um, the importance of their role on the, the Joint Staff. So the planners, back to this job, um, anytime anything came up to that level where the chairman was going to meet with the service chiefs, we would go, we would prepare a brief, do a lot of homework, a lot of research, and then we'd go in and brief the CNO before the meeting with the chairman. So he had background information on what's going to happen at the meeting. Oh, okay. And he would, he would be able to articulate or think about a Navy position on this particular issue, whether it was NATO or it could be anything from a NATO operation to what's happening with medical benefits or, you know, for active duty service personnel. I mean, it span the gamut. Yeah, so you would, I might get an assignment one day that's like one of them, my very first one was on mining, landmines. Mm. What do sailors know about landmines? Mm. Nothing. Right. So I had to get busy, do my homework. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You were also chief of staff for the Navy's anti-terrorism and force protection task force. Yeah, after the USS Cole was attacked. Oh into October 12th of 2000. Yeah, so that's the third big highlight of my career. So the coal was attacked in Aden, the Yemeni port of Aden, on October 12th, 2000. And where were you? I was on the, I was the Navy planner and I got ripped out of that job and became the nominal chief of staff of this new anti-terrorism force protection task force to try to fix or come up with some possible fixes for the Navy's posture, anti-terrorism force protection posture. So what did you do? <laughs> um, and that was another hard job, a really hard job because... Did you have to work with other agencies for that? Like the um, FBI or the CIA? No, that was sort of out of out of my purview. Any outside organization I worked with, if there was one, it was the NCIS, the Naval Criminal oh, Investigative right. Service. Yeah, but really tangentially, we didn't we weren't involved in the criminal investigation at all, or the terrorism aspect of it. We were tasked with trying to come up with fixes on how to do anti-terrorism and force protection better. So we... To try to avoid it in the future. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, uh, I had a select group of officers from other parts of the Navy staff, and we met sometimes twice a day, usually once a day initially, to come up with some, <clears throat> what we came to call functional areas that we could fix. So personnel, training, port security, situational awareness, education, mm -hmm. training, those kinds of big kind of policy doctrine right. kinds of things. Because it's, it, it has to do with cha operational versus administrative changes of command. The CNO, the sir, all the service chiefs are really in the administrative chain of command, where the operational commanders are the four-star, the fleet command, the three-star fleet commanders, uh, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, the, the Pacific Command, the four-star Pacific Command, those four-star generals and admirals. They're the ones that have to implement this operational stuff. So. 
we did a lot of coordination with those staffs to say, okay, we want to, port security is a good example. The Navy had no port security capabilities. The Coast Guard was the primary port security outfit. And most of their, most of the Coast Guard's port security capability resided in the reserves, even within the Coast Guard. So, okay, we need port security. How do we do it? Um, and we tried to apply an ends, ways, means paradigm to come up with some recommendations. So up until this USS Cole attack, the primary port security outfit was the Coast Guard Reserves? But they weren't in, they weren't in Aden. They were only where the threat con dictated that they should be, the threat conditions. So the port, <clears throat> at the time, the port security for the coal was the coal, its own ship's company. They had no other outside support. And the way this vehicle-borne improvised explosive device was delivered oh. to the coal was these, this, these terrorists were in a motorboat with nice clothes on, mm. posing as harbor personnel. Oh, okay. I mean, they didn't come screaming in to the call, they were just kind of moseying along, all nice and calm, and until they got right to the ship. Yeah. Wow. So it wasn't some kamikaze attack or anything, it was just shh, and then, yeah. So it was even more Better, shocking? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So how many were killed? Do you remember? 17. Yeah, 17. And 39 wounded, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But the coal, the coal was saved. The crew did a miraculous job. The, the ship did not sink. They saved it. And um, we got it back to the States, fixed it, and, and put it back in service. And which terrorist group was it? Um, never really uh. claimed, you know, one terrorist group. Mm -hmm. um, Didn't something else happen just before that? Or around that time? Like, what else was happening then? Was that during Black Hawk Down? Other things happening in Africa at the time. I don't remember. I should remember. Which I should know when Black Hawk Down was. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Okay. The, the, the Unison mission, UN mission in Somalia. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't remember. And then you had the Somalia yeah. Yeah. pirates. Yeah. Now these. Yeah, that's after. But right. these guys, the coal. I mean, they're they were connected with Osama bin Laden. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So you said. So Al Qaeda. Right. You said this task force challenged every assumption and implemented first ever actions that established a visionary model anti-terrorism program for the U.S. Navy. Yeah, and yeah, that's a broad statement to say that we did look at this problem functionally um, and, and worked with the fleet commanders uh, to ensure that what we were thinking about and what we were going to recommend to the CNO and the Secretary of the Navy they could, you know, they could live with and implement. But what you were saying before reminded me of nowadays, I mean, with anti-terrorism, mm -hmm. being so close to New York or just being on mass transit, if you see it, something, say something. See something, say something. That's yeah. what it reminded me of, yeah. just being more proactive. Yeah. And that's, more aware, so one, one of, situational awareness. Situational awareness, yes. that's one of the things we, we really tried to emphasize in our recommendations, mm -hmm. yeah. So from the most junior seaman, the most junior sailor, all the way up to the commanding officer of the unit, everybody should have situational awareness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, Al-Qaeda, um, yeah, I know some of them are. Um, Cobalt Towers, 
One was Cobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. I don't, yeah, I don't remember. That was pretty recent as well. You uh, coordinated the, sorry, you coordinated the development of the Navy's position on wide-ranging policy and program issues deliberated by the Joint Chiefs. That that was the Navy planner job. Oh, I, yep, you already yep, said before, that. Yeah. Yeah. UN, NATO, force protection, freedom of navigation, yeah. rules of engagement, you said port security, foreign military sales, mm -hmm. um, military doctrine training, ed education, combatant commander, regional issues, special ops, theater ballistic missile defense. Yeah. So, and so personnel yeah. landmines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was our that was our portfolio, so to speak. Counter narcotics operations, yeah. manpower validation programs, human resources strategy, reserve component affairs, and defense medical oversight council. So those those were some of the issues that came up for the CNO uh, when he went to the Joint um, Chiefs meetings, you know. Right. Um, so, when after I guess after Maine, is that when you ended up in Carlisle? Where did you go after Maine? Oh, uh, after VP10, after VP10, I went to the Naval War College as a student. Is that in Carlisle? No, no Naval War College is in Newport, Rhode Island. Yes, yeah, so we jumped ahead a little bit. <clears throat> so after, <clears throat> excuse me. After my command tour of VP-10, I went to Newport, Rhode Island as a student, the Naval War College, and that's where I got my master's degree. Oh, okay. Then, after that, I went to Carlisle, to the Army War College, as an as faculty member. So in the sequence, it's VP-10, Naval War College, Army War College, as a faculty member. Then, after the Army War College, that's when I went to the Navy staff. And that's when the call was attacked. I guess I'm confused. All right, so you and your family moved from Maine to Rhode Island, and no, then they didn't. No, they stayed in Maine. Oh, okay. I drove. I commuted on the weekends. Oh, okay. You but familiar with the term geographic bachelor? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I can. Imagine what yeah, that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did that three oh. times. It was hard. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so you were a faculty instructor at the, even though you were still, would you say active duty Navy? Or oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. At, you were at the U.S. Army War College. Yeah, because it's a part of when I mentioned Goldwater Nichols. Part of Goldwater Nichols required. Uh, flag officers to have a joint assignment um, and all the service schools became joint. So at the Naval War College we had Army Air Force officers. At the, Na at the Army War College the same thing. They had Naval officers and Air Force officers. At the Air Force War College in Montgomery, Alabama there's Navy and Army. So all the senior service schools are joint. So they have joint, they have joint students, but they also have joint faculty members. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you, um, you helped design, plan, and execute a yearly 600-person strategic crisis yeah, the, exercise? Yeah, the um, big, when I was there, they, they have since changed it, but when I was there, uh, there was a, it was five or six days long, so all the students and all the faculty members plus, plus outside help, like they would hire contractors. Mm -hmm. Most of them were retired, you know, mm -hmm. military people. Uh, yeah, so there was almost a one to one ratio of people working on the exercise and the number of students in it. Yeah. So it was almost, yeah, 50 50. 300 students, 300 people working on the thing. Can't beat those yeah. odds. Yeah. Very complicated. I mean, they threw, the people who designed 
the exercise, uh, really, we threw everything at these students. They really had a hard time. Oh, they deal did? Crises all over the world they had to deal with. Oh, okay. Um, we did uh, simulated congressional hearings. So somebody would, one of the students would play, for example, the chief of staff of the army. And there was a crisis, you know, in country X. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some, something else going on, or maybe five things going on. Mm -hmm. And there was a congressional hearing and the student playing the chief of staff of the army would have to go before this congressional hearing. And they, it was, oh, okay. it was tough <laughs> for these students. Yeah. It was pretty realistic. Okay, yeah. In 1998, you were awarded the Admiral William F. Halsey Chair of Maritime Studies. Yeah, that's uh, recognition at the Army War College. Uh, one of the naval officers who's on the faculty there uh, gets awarded that. So um, it was for recognition as my uh, as for my job as one of the Navy instructors there, Navy faculty members. A senior exercise planner for the chairman of the Joint. Chiefs of Staff, you developed, coordinated, executed, and evaluated comprehensive exercises involving multinational military services, DOD agencies, and numerous other federal departments and organizations. This required significant interagency coordination and planning across the federal government. Exercises included long-term mobilization, NATO contingency plans, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs No Notice Exercise, exercise Program. Yeah. So that's going back. Us. Yeah, uh, that's going back to my first. Uh, time in the Pentagon on the Joint Staff, yeah. As a naval aviator, Tom served as an instructor pilot in the P-3 Orion Aircraft and Force Squadrons, classroom simulator and aircraft from 1983 to 1995. He authored Instructor Pilot Instructor Flight Engineering Standardization Manual and developed corollary training programs and independent study guides to teach pilots and flight engineers aircraft systems and normal and emergency procedures. He served as the Deputy Chief Instructor Pilot for 12 Pacific Fleet P-3 Orion squadrons, responsible for all safety of flight issues and uh, standard operating procedures, and provided oversight of in-flight and ground examination of 540 pilots and flight engineers. How do you know yeah. how many? Well, that's over that, that yeah. many. Okay, so we, um, uh, earlier we talked about the model manager and the P3 model manager on the West Coast, uh, the, who was the commanding officer of VP31. Oh, that did the uh, inspections? Right, right. So um, as the VP31 NATOPS officer, uh, the pilot NATOPS officer, I was the assistant evaluator. There was a commander. A Navy commander 05 who was the the chief evaluator who worked directly for the commanding officer so I was this uh, this other commander's deputy so just we know how many you know just doing the arithmetic we, we I know how many pilots were in each squadron I know how many aviators or oh, okay. how, how many flight engineers were in each squadron and we did everybody once a year and I did that for I did that twice Oh, okay. uh, so I yeah, so I just, just did, did the math. Just did the arithmetic, yeah. yeah, yeah. As an aircraft pilot in command and mission commander, he amassed over three thousand seven hundred real world operational and training flight hours while conducting missions from airfields worldwide. And you did say that you will always miss your shipmates with whom you serve. Yes, yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think that was the hardest thing for me, making the transition after I retired to civilian life yeah, and civilian job. Mm -hmm. The camaraderie, it's hard, to, it's hard to match. It's hard to uh, mm -hmm. find the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did life change for you after you uh, retired in 2001? That was the same year as 9-11. Yeah, uh, so June 30th, July 1st was my official last day of active duty, 2001. And then I'm at home looking, you know, looking for a job. Later that summer. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and doing some substitute teaching. And my wife was uh, on the faculty at Shippensburg University. 
in Chippensburg, Pennsylvania, just south of Carlisle. And um, so we weren't going to move. Uh, I wasn't going to move my family. I right. was going to, we were going to stay put and I was going to find a job in the Harrisburg area. Um, yeah, and then 9-11 happened. And um, so uh, I really thought I was going to get recalled to active duty. That can happen after you retire? Yes. Yes, it's right in your, it's, it's, oh. it's articulated in your retirement orders that the Secretary oh. of the Navy can recall you to active duty. How old were you then? <laughs> um, can I ask? Uh, I don't know, 55, 56, 46, 47? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there were a lot who <clears throat> were yeah. deployed. Middle-aged um, people were went to the desert. Right, right. And who I interviewed. So after a couple of weeks, I couldn't stand it anymore, and I called my detailer. Oh. You know, and uh, and he said, I said, are you planning on recalling retirees? He said, no, we, not right now. Mm. He said they were working with the reservists, and they had enough mm. people between the reservists and active duty. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But. My time on the Navy's Anti-Terrorism and Force Protection Task Force after the attack on the coal led me to my first job after I retired um, because uh, I got could, through some interviews, you know, job interviews, um, I got connected with a small consulting firm outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the aviation no no this this the ceo the president of this company had worked in state government and was more or less a developer for lack of a better description but he was savvy enough to know that after 9 11 there were going to there was going to be some grant money from either from the federal government from the state government or both to help state and emergency management agencies do emergency management and anti-terrorism planning. And so he called me and said, I want you to come in and develop this new line of business for this, for my company. That was so, a challenge. Yeah, yeah, so my first job after I retired was doing emergency management and Homeland Security planning. Yeah, so. Wow. And everybody, was a, it was a steep learning curve for everybody. So you said your first job after retirement? Yeah. You've had others. I've had others, yeah. So I went from that job to uh, Penn State, um, where I helped start a master's program in Homeland Security for Penn State. Oh. Yeah, and in 2009 we started that. So that was, and that was another great connection with a faculty member who I worked with in this consulting company. I needed a logistician for a project I was working on. Mm -hmm. And through one phone call and networking and another phone call and some more networking, I found this faculty member at Penn State Harrisburg. And we hit it off immediately. Mm -hmm. And we had established a great relationship. And then one day he called me and said, Penn State is thinking about starting a master's program in Homeland Security. Are you interested? And I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I came in, I interviewed for, for a job and helped the, the, exist a number of existing faculty members at Penn State, Penn State University at State College and in Harrisburg, had already started the bureaucratic wheels moving to develop this program. And I kept, kept, came in, by the time I joined, that we were ready to start writing syllabi and writing, writing, putting together course materials. So they had already done the bureaucratic part and about getting the program actually approved through the university and the graduate council, which is a long process in academia to get something like that approved. Um, yeah, so that, so we started teaching in 09 and uh, I was there till June of 16. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and that was, that was great. That was very rewarding. So as a graduate, all distance ed, all online. Did you have field program. trips? No, no. Our program in, in the distance ed education world, <clears throat> um, there's a term synchronous teaching and asynchronous. Synchronous me meaning, okay, we're in this course and we're going to meet 
online every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 o'clock. So that would be a synchronous environment. Asynchronous means just the exact opposite. You never meet right. collectively as a class. Right. And that was our program. Our program was entirely asynchronous because we had people literally all over the world. I mean, I had students in Iraq and Afghanistan taking my courses. So that would be really hard for them to meet at, you know, Tuesday at 2000 East Coast time. I mean, what does that mean to them? You know, so our program was all asynchronous. And that was based on our student, our student need. I have a dumb question. Yeah. How do you know if they're on the up and up? What do you mean? How do you know they're not terrorists? Taking a Homeland Security course. Uh, you don't really, unless they if they forged, they forged everything. They forged their letters of recommendation. They forged oh. their, their transcripts, their college transcripts. Oh, okay. You know, we and during the admission process, we vet the students. I mean, we check. Oh, okay. We check their letters of recommendation. We check their transcripts. Yeah. And could they yeah. hack into Penn State World Campus or? University of Maryland University College or Arizona State University mm -hmm. District, sure. Penn uh, State, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, one of the things I did at Penn State was we got a grant called the Intelligence Community Centers for Academic Excellence. And uh, it's a grant from the intelligence community to get students, young graduates, uh, young adults to pursue entry-level careers in the intelligence community. Um, and one of the things we did was we held a couple of conferences for students interested in pursuing careers in intelligence. And that was one of my jobs as part of this grant, executing this grant, was I put together the conferences. And one of the conferences we had, uh, one of our speakers talked about exactly that hacking, how, how much uh, colleges and universities are hacked and they're constantly getting hit all the time, mm -hmm. especially for the research that they conduct. So big land-grant universities like Penn State uh, does, you know, classified research. They're constantly getting, you know, pinged. Attempts, trying to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how much change have you seen to, um, throughout those years in the Department of Homeland Security? Oh, from when it, from 2001 or 2000, well it started, first it started as the Office of Homeland Security with Governor Ridge, Tom Ridge, under President Bush. Then the Homeland Security Act of 2002 made it a federal department. So between President Bush and Congress, you know, realized we need a new federal department. So that became the Department of Homeland Security. But it, ha it has evolved significantly. I'm just I mean, for the good, but it's still... Right. I'm just curious, yeah. when did it include the Coast Guard? In the, at the, the, the Homeland Security Act of 2002. Oh, that long? Established all the components. So the Secret Service moved to the Homeland Security Coast Guard. Oh, I didn't know board. it was that long ago. Yeah, initially. They were initially moved in there from the Department of Transportation. Yeah. Yeah. So Coast Guard was never Department of Defense? Never, no. Coast Guard's always Department Why of Transportation. Why would it have been transportation? Because of all its other other missions. There's, I think there's 14 or so Coast Guard missions, you know, port, port safety, aids to navigation, inland waterways, search and rescue, oh, okay. all those other missions that they oh, have. Oh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you're, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I, now, I wasn't now, thinking that. There is a caveat. During time of war, the president can move the Coast Guard under the Department of Defense, but it's always been the Department of Transportation. And then... It, that is so informative. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad that yeah. you said that. But now it's in, now it's in DHS. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. And they're great. I, 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 back to my Anti-Terrorism Force Protection Task Force, um, after the attack on the coal, I worked with some Coast Guard officers specifically to try to put together some kind of port security structure because mm -hmm. we didn't I didn't know about port security they did and they are just great I mean I can't say enough about the Coast Guard they are just really super yes. and they don't get enough kudos I don't think 
Sounds they like it. they're a small outfit and they do so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I fell in love with the Coast Guard when I was at the mm -hmm. Pentagon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. I forget what else I wanted to say. Um, something about your U Penn. You Penn State. Penn State. No, Penn State. Penn State. Penn State, Penn State I'm yeah. Do you miss uh, working there? Wait, what did you do? After? You retired then from there? I left there and uh, for a little while I was the chief security officer for a medical marijuana company in Pennsylvania. Um, another friend called me up and asked me if I wanted to, to do this. So I, was, I don't know what it is about me and trying new things all the time, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, I talked that over with my wife a lot, you know, do I really want to do this? And I thought it'd be very interesting, lots of challenges for a new program in, in Pennsylvania. For right. veterans? F no, for medical marijuana. Oh, for in the state. In the state, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, uh, enormous security challenges. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd give it a shot. Um, so you would be outlining and, those challenges and... And try it. Yeah, f for example, because marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, it's a Schedule One drug. Um, as of 2019, when we're January of 2019, when we're doing this interview, um, it's an all-cash business. So you can't use credit cards, you can't use banks because it's inter interstate commerce. You can't use credit cards and everything. So it's an all-cash business. So that right there, right off the bat, that's a huge security concern for me or for the you know the company what do you do with all that cash mm. yeah so um, yeah, so that's yeah. but what happened in Pennsylvania was the company I worked for did not get a permit did not get a license in the first round of applications and the second round the phase two in Pennsylvania wasn't going to be for another I don't know, year a year and a half and by that time my wife and I had decided to retire so, so oh, I left okay. Yeah. But I, I laid the groundwork for the person that followed me. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. Good for so, you. Yeah. Yeah. So. You are one hard working person. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm ready to enjoy the fruits of my labor. Mm -hmm. so. As well you should. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back on your time in service, Tom. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the sacrifice that you made in service to your country? How do I feel about it? You know, no, nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, I feel great about it. It was all, all worthwhile. I don't, I have no, no regrets whatsoever. The hardest thing for me was being away from my family. Oh sure. I, I didn't mind. I didn't mind the hard work. I didn't mind the long hours. Um, I didn't mind all the challenges. It was the hardest thing was was leaving my wife and kids. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And now it's even tougher. I mean, when I when I was on active duty, my deployments were pretty much six months. I only got extended once when I was on the Carl Vinson. My second deployment on Carl Vinson, we got extended mm -hmm. a couple months. Um, but other than that, they were pretty much six months. And you can count on it. The families can count on it. Now, I don't. Know, it's right. it's tough. It's really tough on families. Mm -hmm. Really tough. Right. Yeah. So I, my heart goes out to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I I thoroughly enjoyed my time in service. Yeah. I think I remember a question I wanted to ask somewhere along the way. When you heard what happened with the terrorists on 9/11. How they were in Florida with the training, the pilot training. Yeah, yeah. What were your it's, thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, after the call was attacked, you know, we talked about Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda uh, as the perpetrators. Um, when the task force, the anti-terrorism force protection task force, was getting um, stood up and established, and I was trying to put this all together. The two-star admiral I was working for directly, uh, we had a little meeting. There was a very small meeting around his office conference table, and we were just brainstorming on 
what could happen next. And the boat, so you're familiar with the term IED, right? Improvised Explosive oh, Device, sure. right? The boat that Al-Qaeda used, the terrorists used, um, was a V B I E D, a vehicle borne improvised explosive device. Mm -hmm. And when this two star admiral asked me that question, I said, It's going to be an airplane. And he was a submariner, so he couldn't relate to what I was thinking about. I said, It's easy to put 100 pounds or 200 pounds of explosive in a Cessna. Anybody could fly it. It's so easy. All you have to do is just get in the air and point it straight down at the target. And he looked at me like I had three eyes. He didn't, I said, no, it's, it's, it's almost too easy. So that was October of 2000. Mm -hmm. And then September of less, than a, year less than a year later, we get airliners doing it. Yeah. And so. they were trained to fly in Florida where you were trained, right? Oh, it, oh well, I was trained at... By, I know. The, by the Navy, they were trained by some private. But I mean, what were your thoughts when you heard that? Were you shocked or? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure I was. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole nation was shocked. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole new reality yeah, for yes, us. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, when you retired, did you go back and uh, have reunions or join any kind of veteran groups? Or your um, ship? Your ship? Did they have a group? We had um, some squadron reunions for the VP-50 accident. So in, so oh, in okay. um, the significant, like the 10 year or the 25 year mm -hmm. anniversary of the accident from VP-50, we tried to get together out in California. Um, and I'm a member of the Naval Academy Alumni Association and we have class reunions. Do the uh, families of the victims go? Too? Yes. Yeah. Not, you know, some go. Some go. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what about the kids growing up? They had children, right? Some of them did, yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, did you join any groups, like veteran groups? You mean like VFW or no, that American Legion? That wouldn't apply Legion? to you, would that? Sure. Oh sure. yeah. But no, no, I have, I have not joined any. Oh okay. Yeah. And you've never been injured, right? Correct. Okay. You mean combat-related injuries or no? Yeah, no disabilities or no. Okay. Yeah. And what about the VA? Have you used the VA? Yes. Yeah, Tricare VA. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And that so far, that's been very, very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was at Penn State, I used Penn State's medical plan. Um, but after that, yeah, I went on TRICARE, and it's, so far it's been great. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a, a clinic right at the Army War College, so I don't have to go very far. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're lucky. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Yes, very lucky. Yeah. All right, well, Tom, so, uh, we will go outside and grab your uh, memorabilia. But okay. What I just want to say now is that I'm honored and humbled that you're here today yeah. to speak to me yeah. of your sacrifice and contributions that you made in service to our country. Yeah. Thank you and God bless you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Great job. Yeah, okay. Sure. 
This is uh, Naval Air Station, Brunswick, Maine. Yes. Do you want to talk about this? Uh, this is from uh, VP-50. Uh, typically, when you leave a squadron or a ship in the Navy, you get a picture and a plaque, uh, and usually all your uh, shipmates sign the picture. So that's what this it's is. Very special. Yes, it is. What does the 70 mean? That's the the whole number of the ship. Oh, okay. This is when so you left? The, uh, this is when I left the Carl Vinson. So this was taken, I've always liked this picture. This was taken during Fleet Week uh, from obviously one of the streets in San Francisco as the Carl Vinson's coming into port. So we're passing Alcatraz Island out in the distance and we're going into Alameda. Um, not too far from this location, we're going to pass under the Bay Bridge and then enter the, the port in, in Alameda. And this is uh, the picture that I wanted and all my shipmates signed it. It's a unique picture. So the, the VP-10 got this for me when I left the squadron as at mm. my change of command. They gave me that. That's very nice. Okay. This is a command pennant um, on deployment in Sicily, in Siganella, Sicily, mm -hmm. when I was in VP-10. We worked for the... Uh, Commander Task Force 67, CTF 67. Mm -hmm. And the squadron was designated CTG Task Group 67.1, and this is just represents the command pennant. Or it is the command pennant, I should. Right. It's on the whole squadron. Where? Yeah, we did that at, in Brunswick. Right. Brunswick, Maine. This I got uh, when I left the Navy. Oops. When I left the Navy staff. Um, when you retired? When I, when I retired, yeah. Pentagon. But it's. The picture slipped. Let's see uh, how it's. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that I got from the joint staff. Um, when I left, and all the flag officers signed it. So this is the chairman. General Shelton was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs when I left. The CNO, Admiral Clark, the Secretary of the Navy, Richard Danzig, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and this Admiral Tim Keating, who I worked for directly. A 
couple other flag officers, Admiral Zlatiper and Admiral Byrd. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Call task force. And then I got a notebook in here from the VP-50 accident. So I don't know how you, what you mm -hmm. want to do about that. What do you want to do? Do you want to film it? Um, I don't know what, how, if it would mean anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. You took that on your missions? Yeah, the flight bag with our flight helmet in it. Mm -hmm. is, it is it in there now? Yeah. Oh, let's see it. Yeah. When's the last time you put it on? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't, ha we didn't have to wear it in the P-3. It was just for emergencies. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. This is a T-44, uh, let's see what, a T-44 Pegasus. This was the plane, uh, from the training command mm -hmm. as I was going through flight school. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then this is a typical P3. Mm -hmm. yeah. We did carry harpoon missiles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Genie in the bottle? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh are you, are you going? Yeah, that's from yeah. V VP thirty one, the fleet replacement squadron. Uh that's where all the new aviators and air crewmen learn about the P three and how to operate it, fly and operate it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's a cool one. Yeah, this is from VP fifty. That's from the Carl Vinson. Hmm. Wow. Different. And then this is from VP-10. That's good. So a good representation of squadron plaques. Yes. Ship plaques. Mm -hmm. 